It's really been a great blessing to work with Clark and Charmaine uh, at AUL, and, and I want to encourage anyone that hasn't read Clark's book yet to pick it up. It's an incredible resource for the pro-life movement. Um, speaking of not incredible resources for the pro-life movement, on Friday I received an email from Cecile Richards, the president of uh, Planned Parenthood, and in it she assured me that the pro-life movement um, wants to send women straight back to the 1950s. Although this was decades before I was born, I've been assured by abortion advocacy groups and even President Obama that the 1950s, despite its economic prosperity and family stability, was the pits for American women. Um, this was the pre roe era with draconian laws that did not allow abortion on demand. And as Clark noted, Roe was built upon many myths. Uh, according to one myth at Roe's foundation was that legalizing abortion on demand would make abortion safe. However, as one of Charmaine noted uh, in one example, Tanya Reeves, a young African-American mother who bled to death after her uterus was lacerated during an abortion, was not the victim of a clandestine procedure performed before Roe versus Wade. Her future was not cut short by now convicted murderer Dr. Kermit Gosnell in his Philadelphia clinic dubbed the House of Horrors, the injury, which ultimately led to Tanya's death, was inflicted by an abortionist in one of Cecile Richards' Planned Parenthood clinics right on Chicago's Michigan Avenue in July 2012. Tanya's tragic death is one of the many examples that underscores that making abortion legal and available has not made abortion safe, and substandard clinic conditions are not the only cause of abortion-related injury and death. Whether accomplished by an invasive surgical procedure or by taking a combination of potent drugs, an abortion carries inherent physical risks for women. The undisputed risks of immediate complications, ones that even Planned Parenthood will acknowledge, uh, include blood clots, hemorrhage, incomplete abortions, infection, and injury to the cervix and other organs. Abortion can also cause cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, renal failure, failure metabolic disorder, or shock. Abortion also increases the risk of preterm birth in future pregnancies, which can have serious health consequences and is the leading cause of infant death, both globally and in the United States. Induced abortion is also a risk factor for women developing placenta previa in future pregnancies, which can cause severe bleeding before or during delivery and can be dangerous for both the mother and the baby. And as up to 75% of women who have, an induced, uh, who have an induced abortion, and that's three out of every four, will become pregnant again, the impact on her reproductive future health uh, and, and that of her subsequently born children is vital information to a woman considering abortion. But the physical dangers for women and their future children are not abortion's only risks. Unlike any other procedure, abortion involves the intentional termination of a human life giving abortion a moral dimension with potential emotional or psychological consequences that a patient undergoing a tonsillectomy, for example, would never incur. Now, Planned Parenthood's website, uh, Advice to Women Thinking About Abortion, does acknowledge that some women feel anger, regret, or sadness, with, of course, the caveat, for a little while. Perhaps a better gauge than the advice page for an organization that profits from each abortion that it sells is the decades of medical evidence that reveals that abortion carries significant psychological risk factors, including increased risks of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And as Charmaine also mentioned, there are thousands of women who have come forward and bravely shared their stories through campaigns like Silent No More in an effort to raise awareness of abortion's negative, and negative physical and emotional effects. But many abortion stories go untold and complications are unreported. That sad fact is verified not by just pro-life uh, advocates, but abortion advocates. And at the time of the Gosnell trial, Susan Schuel, for example, the executive director of the Women's Medical Fund, a group which actually provides abortion funding in Philadelphia, described her experience of trying to work with women to file complaints with the Pennsylvania Health Department. Ms. Shul explained, the women found the complaint process so onerous and the telling of their stories so personally difficult that they failed to complete the paperwork and just abandoned their effort. And there was no avenue for Ms. Shul to file the complaints on their behalf. Complaints had to be filed by the patients. Another former employee of Planned Parenthood of the Heartland in Iowa, Sue Thayer, alleges in her whistleblower case um, that Planned Parenthood 
told its telemed chemical abortion patients who later experienced significant bleeding to just go to an emergency room and report that they were experiencing a spontaneous miscarriage. Countless other negative health stories go unreported because they go unconnected to the abortion that caused them. One nurse who left a Planned Parenthood in Delaware because of its meat market type assembly line care, her words, not mine, not because of any change of heart on abortion, testified last year before the Delaware Senate that the sad thing is that these women may not even realize the fact that Planned Parenthood could be at fault for these medical tragedies to both them and their future children, even, in, even years after they had their abortions at Planned Parenthood. But we're in an increasingly health-conscious society that where we mandate fast food restaurants post calorie counts, and where the US Surgeon General routinely warns Americans about the health risks of smoking or being overweight, there seems to be little interest in, in ensuring that abortion comes with the warning label that it clearly deserves. Why? Because the health risks of abortion undermine that false narrative that's pushed by big abortion. Namely, that the debate surrounding abortion requires choosing sides between mothers and their unborn children. The truth is that abortion harms mothers and their children, even their children in future pregnancies. Highlighting abortion's harm to women does not ignore the humanity of the unborn, but it exposes at the core of one of the myths being used to sell abortion. It rejects that false paradigm of women versus the unborn that has been used to insulate the abortion industry. The truth about abortion's harm to women strikes at the myths that lay at the foundation of Roe. The pro-life movement is not actually attempting to take women back to the 1950s. We're forging a way forward, beyond our current state that pits mothers against their children, to an era that does not devalue motherhood and that does not use abortion as an excuse not to make institutional changes that truly respect women's equality. We are headed towards a day where both women and children will be respected, protected, welcomed, and thriving.